Greetings from the fireside. My name is Frodan. This weekend, we're going to have eight players battle out for $100,000 and one spot in the World Championship. Joining me on stage are those set eight players so we can get familiar with their faces as we have four matches that's going to be happening today, all best of seven single elimination conquest. Let's go ahead and meet our four players of players. Starting from my far right, we have our last match of the day. It is Abar from Michigan against Tere, local to Southern California. Our third match over to my right, we have Pascoa hailing from Brazil, the first Brazilian player, up against Roof Trellin. Brian Kibler's pick and Spirit Animal, apparently. Over to my far left, we have our second match of the day. It's Hot Meowth up against Monsanto, represented from Quebec, Canada. And our first, but certainly not the least, match of the day. To my left, we have Dude7597 up against Topo Pablo from Chile. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me on stage. Please exit to the right and prepare for your matches. In the meantime, Topo. Dude, please stay for a quick interview before we get for our first match. My first question today goes to Dude. You are considered by many people, not just TJ, but to be one of the favorites at the top eight. How does that make you feel? Does that put too much pressure on you? Uh, there's a lot of pressure, but I appreciate all, uh, all the fans who are supporting me. Absolutely, as well as your teammates back at home, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, and Topo Pablo, uh, you come in here as a player that people don't necessarily know too much about. You come in with the pressure of Latin America. Will you be the first champion here in the Americas region for Latin America? Te vienes ahí con con gente que no sabe quién eres, con mucha presión de casa. Vas a ser el primero campeón. Sí, en verdad no siento presión. Estoy muy tranquilo. Sé que voy a ganar, así que nada, a ganar. Yeah, actually, I don't feel any pressure. I know I'm going to win, so I'm here to win it. Ooh, I like that vote of confidence. Well, with that, go ahead and shake hands, gentlemen. And may the best man win. We're going to send it over to our commentators in just a second. But in the meantime, take a look about what these two guys had to say about each other. Ya sabía con quién me iba a tocar. Debería ganar con los de que, que traje yo. I brought Dragon Warrior, Druid, Shaman, just three of the best decks, but I also brought Freeze Mage, which is a deck most people consider to not be very good right now, just because I think I can play it well. Tenía la in intuición de que Dude iba a jugar Freeze Mage. I think the most important part is anticipation and being able to map out your opponent's turns. No lo conozco mucho, pero me imagino que todos los que estamos acá somos buenos, así que and just trying to make your opponent's turns awkward, I think uh, sets really good players apart. Tengo mucha fe de que le va a ganar. Welcome to the desk. My name is Cora, and I'm joined this weekend by Nathan. That's Admirable Zamora. We have got some awesome quarterfinal matches for you guys coming up today. But first off, it is going to be Dude7597 versus Topo Pablo. Dude, a native from Seattle, Washington, and Pablo, of course, the first Chilean representative we've had here uh, at the HCT Championships. Admirable, you've been saying, you know, time and time again that Latin America's time to shine is now. How do you feel about Pablo's chances? Well, I did pick him to win this entire event and TJ happened to pick dude to win the entire event so big stakes of this one but uh, mm -hmm. as far as this event is concerned you know uh, I wasn't entirely sold on it I did feel the play has been stepped up but after talking with Topo Pablo uh, over the weekend it, it is he has a fantastic mind for the game while I don't think he's the strongest technical player here I do think that his plan that he developed is incredibly strong for this one and, and as far as I'm concerned I think having a strong plan is better than having strong technical skills Absolutely, and let's talk about those bands real quick. We actually just saw that Pablo banned out Dude's Hunter deck and Dude banned Pablo's Dragon Warrior. The Warrior makes sense because Dude is bringing Freeze Mage. Uh, what do you make of that Hunter ban? I feel like the Hunter ban is really spot on for here. I mean, I think Topo Pablo anticipates his warrior being banned in the situation since Dude has brought Freeze Mage. Uh, and if you look at Hunter, it's going to line up pretty darn well versus Druid and versus his Tempo Mage. And in the Hunter mirror match, I think Dude even has an edge due to a couple of, of tech choices that were in there. So I think this ban, while it certainly looks non-standard, it's actually pretty smart considering the lineups. 
Absolutely. We're going to see how that hunter ban works out for Pablo. But first, we've got the mage mirror. This is, however, tempo mage for Pablo and freeze mage for dude. Now, in the prelims, Pablo actually beat Pasqua with uh, the tempo mage versus the freeze mage deck. So uh, do you think that he's going to be able to do that again? Or do you think dude's freeze mage might be just a little bit too strong? Well, normally, I I'm going to say that the temp I say the, uh, freeze mage has a, has a bit of an advantage in this matchup. And Topo Pablo having a copy of flame strike in here, I think, is a little bit of a detriment. But if you take a look at the way the hands are structured right now, Tobo Pablo has one of those incredibly strong starts. He's got double Mana Worm, he's got the coin, he's got Colt Sorcerer, and he's got Fireball. What he's looking to do in this matchup is basically get minions on the board and have them stick. If those minions get to deal repetitive damage. That means that dude doesn't have burn spells. He's spending time digging through his deck. If that's the kind of time that Topo Pablo gets, he can deliver massive damage and have a final blow with those burn spells to finish off the game. Absolutely, and if the, the Freeze Mage can get that strong start, get their cycle, uh, Novice Engineers, Loot Hoarders, Arcane Intellects are also very strong in this matchup, then the Freeze Mage can certainly keep up with the Tempo Mage and sort of push back the aggression. But uh, for Dude, his hand is a little bit slow. We do see a copy of both secrets in hand and none of that cycle. But, you know, we actually did have a chance to play a little bit with both Dude and Pablo yesterday, and Dude's Freeze Mage skill is very, very high. So do you think that this hand is going to be that much of a problem or you know how do you think that this might play well, out for him well initially it was looking pretty rough i mean ice barrier i think is a pretty key card to this matchup just being able to extend uh, the minion pressure which isn't a ton of minion pressure so ice barrier is a very effective tool there uh, but he picked up frostbolt and then he picked up forgotten torch mm -hmm. which are two of the main tools you're looking for in this matchup they're going to kill almost all of topo pablo's minions uh, in terms of a one for one card and, and that's a big deal, because if Dude can find time, that's exactly what he's looking for. If he gets to the late game, he has the massive advantage. As the Freeze Mage, you normally want to be able to bring all that burn into your hand, group it up, reduce it with Emperor Tharasan, and then you want to use that burn to kill your opponent very quickly. Uh, but in this case, Dude has been using that burn to clear off Pablo's minions. What do you think his, his win plan is going to be in that case? Well, that's exactly what it is. It's just kind of extend the game here. I mean, the fact that, that if he can kill minions piece by piece, and get to that late stage, it, it's almost insurmountable for Topo Pablo at that point, unless he just has a ton of burn. And what he's picked up lately isn't really a ton of burn. I and mean, we saw him drop Flame Strike super early. There's one copy of that in his build. Arcane Blast is just, it's just pretty poor against this deck. The situation's gonna work okay, but he, that's a second Arcane Blast now. I mean, he's looking to get something on board and, and have it stick. And if he's not, that's not happening, it means he wants to draw his draw spells, like mm -hmm. Arcane Intellect. Those are such important tools to this. Now, dude's hand isn't super fantastic at this point, but who does it benefit when both players have bad hands? The slower deck or the quicker deck, Cora? I would I would go with the quicker deck. Uh, but you know what? The, the, it's, it's tough to say. The control deck plays for the long game. Uh, the quick deck... Actually, you know, I'm going to change my answer. It's the control deck because the quick deck, if they don't have the good hand, has a very tough time of amassing their pieces. And then the control deck is the one that wants to play to the long game. Right. Like the control decks, they're 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 okay with passing turns at times. Mm -hmm. They they don't have to do anything. That and that's the beauty of playing control decks is is that sometimes your best turn is just to say go. Yeah. But in this case, you know, Pablo had that strong start. And the Tempo Mage doesn't have a lot of minion stability in the mid game. It does have the Azure Drakes. Uh, Pablo's playing one po one copy of that Cabalist Tome. But other than some really nice early game, if you don't curve out well from there, if the early game doesn't give you that board pressure that you need, you don't have a lot of minions to really draw into. So we're seeing that right now from Pablo. He's having a tough time uh, drawing into more board pressure, whereas Dude, like you said, is able to sort of just react, and, and that's going to put him in a more you know favorable position going right. on. And, and that's that's an important note you hit too. I mean, Azure Drake's and Kabbalah's Tome, and of course Yogg-Saron, that's basically the reload from this deck. Mm -hmm. Now, I know anytime you talk to Sottle, he'll tell you exactly how much he loves Kabbalah's Tome. He thinks it's a fantastic <laughs> tool <laughs> that mages can use to reload hands with uh, with very consistent spells. But is that going to be enough versus Dude in this matchup? I mean, he's already got Alex Straza. He's got an Ice Barrier down. He's at 27, and he's got two copies of Ice Block. Topo Pablo cannot take advantage of the fact right now that Dude's hand is weak, and that is the liability for him. 
that Kabbalist Tome could potentially be a game changer if it were to uh, give Pablo something like an ice block. And at the end of the day, it gives you spells. It gives you fodder for that Yogg-Saron, which we see in Pablo's hand. So anything can happen when you have enough spells. Uh, Yogg-Saron is, of course, a game changer. So dude is struggling a little bit for some cycle. Going to go ahead and play that Thalnos and trying once again just to repopulate his hand. That's, that's a significant draw here for Topo Pablo. Something that was really interesting to note is that Topo Pablo didn't choose to Forgotten Torch last turn. You know, in this matchup, you basically, once you've been stifled on your early game, you just want to drop burn spells. And so that Forgotten Torch not only is going to help fuel uh, the Yogg-Saron that's coming later on, but it's also going to help put an additional burn spell in his deck to draw. I mean, six damage is nothing to scoff at in these kinds of situations. And Babbling Book ends up picking up Kona Cold, a tool that's, that's not very useful in this matchup. And if he does not draw some minion pressure or draw some massive burn, it's, it's going to start getting ugly. Yeah, the later the game goes on, the more that the game just swings into dude's favor. Uh, we see the Alexstrasza in hand, which could be used as a defensive Alexstrasza to boost himself back up to 15 health, but he's at 26 health right now. That's not looking like it's going to be necessary at all for him. Yeah, I mean, the, the offensive Alex Strauss in this matchup is is really the potential you unlock when you get to such a safe a safe spot like this. You know, he's already used two of his Frost Bolts, so unlocking the potential of Ice Lance is it's much more difficult. It's looking like it actually may be coupled with that Frost Nova mm -hmm. this game, but being able to deliver eight points of damage with Alex or per, or, pour, or pull eight points of damage, blah, excuse me, from, from Topo Pablo's side, that's just more extension. It's offense and defense at the same time when you get to that spot. Absolutely, and Pablo has a large hand, but nothing too impactful right now. He's really looking for a Flame Waker to be able to combine with those cards that might not be as effective in this matchup. The Mirror Image, the Cone of Cold, really not doing much at all. There aren't a lot of minions coming out from the Freeze Mage, so he really just wants to get the Flame Waker combined with those pretty much useless spells and try to put some pressure on dude. Now, something that's interesting to note is you saw Topo Pablo there kind of counting in his head and calculating something. When I, when I spoke with him uh, about sort of his play style and how he likes to play, he loves to take risks when the time calls for it. In this situation, though, he's really kind of, kind of putting his heart on his sleeve there. Like, if dude's paying attention to that, he knows he's counting something. And if, if dude's very keen and knows this matchup, what is he counting? He's got to be counting damage at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a really interesting thing to note is, is the fact that both players can see each other and he's still uh, having that sort of physical aspect that way. Dude finally picks up some of that really important cycle. He gets the arcane intellect and picks up the Roaring Torch and the Acolyte of Pain. That was a really nice series of draws for him. He needs to consistently refuel his hand. We haven't seen Emperor Tharason to provide any discounts, but that's almost okay because his hand right now isn't full of that burn that he wants to see. He does have the Fireball, the Roaring Torch, the Ice Lance, which will be really nice if you combine it with the Frost Bolt. Uh, but for now, those reductions aren't super necessary, so he just wants to keep picking up more and more cycle and uh, really digging deeper and deeper into his deck. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing really, like, outstanding about Dude's deck. It's pretty much like a stock freeze mage mm -hmm. list that you would imagine. Um, and so once he's gotten to this point, again, at 25 with an ice barrier up and with an, um, with an ice block, it's going to be so hard for Topo Pablo to launch an assault this game. You know, I'm thinking something crazy from Yogg-Saron is going to have to happen if Topo Pablo wants a, a real chance in this one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, it may be in something extreme as, as needing to get flair off the Yogg's around to break through this, because right now the ball is in dude's court. Absolutely, and you know, that is certainly possible for Pablo, and he does still have uh, a couple of ways to deal damage in his deck. Like I said, he's got the Flame Wakers, a second Forgotten Torch, which will put, you know, two additional Roaring Torches in his deck. Um, those act as Fireballs, but are one mana cheaper, so that's, that's kind of nice. He does have some tools, but it's just looking pretty difficult for him. I should have definitely made an Ultimate Frisbee reference there. Oh, I, I totally missed, missed opportunities. It. I know. Darn it. Dude is a, is a very avid uh, Ultimate Frisbee player. Mm -hmm. Actually play, competed at Nationals one year. Yeah, I think he actually he won, uh, won state with his high school team and now uh, competed at Nationals last year with his collegiate team. We're actually going to be seeing uh, some really interesting interviews with him about his Ultimate Frisbee playing. Now here comes the damage at this point, and, and I, rightfully so. I mean, Topo Pablo's got to get underway. Mm -hmm. I'm curious here if he actually decides to attack with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. I mean, he knows that one of these secrets is Ice Barrier at the moment. Is, is he going to be able to deliver five additional damage worth of minion attacks this game? I mean, dude has expended almost none of his AoE spells. This, uh, he's actually expended no, none of his AoE mm -hmm. spells at this point, and that's exactly what Topo Pablo's thinking about right here when he foregoes the attacks. Don't proc that armor, and that Alex Strauser right there 
that is spelling disaster for Topo Pablo right now. He's got to believe that dude potentially has the damage in hand to end this. And fortunately for him, it, it's it's close. Dude has uh, the Roaring Torch plus Fireball, that's 12. The ping would give him 13, but the Ice Lands cannot be combined with anything thus far. He does, however, have three potential cycle cards in hand. He has the Arcane Intellect and the Novice Engineer, which can uh, refill, so he, he's most likely gonna find that damage. Uh, so Pablo has to do something right now, sort of a Hail Mary to try and turn this game in his favor. Yeah, I mean, he looks at the situation, and he might even be thinking that this is such an extreme situation he needs to yog Zeron. Now, if he doesn't choose to do that this turn, yog Zeron is certainly slated for the turn after. If that's the case, he's going to try to stall the Alex Alexstrasza attack, build a few more spells, and hope that yog Zeron can pull some big weight. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly possible. You could uh, pull up something like an Ice Block for yourself, a yeah, uh, Flare. Turn. <laughs> but... Uh, and the, here's the thing about it too. This is actually a bit of a detriment here. You know mm -hmm. that, that that button being green on the end turn. That's a good thing for Topo Pablo right now. It means he doesn't have any more decisions to make right now. But when you wait this long to cast Yogs around, those animations take a lot of time. And so if something had happened here, he wouldn't quite know where he was at in this situation. Yeah, you definitely want to try and make those decisions as quickly as you can because uh, if you were to have you know charge minions played on board if you were to have a weapon attached uh, to your hero you want to be able to get all of the value out of your yogsron that you can um sap on the alexstrasza it's not terrible and it's not the one you that's want. unfortunate yeah so it didn't work out quite for Topo pablo this time again i, I think he needed something extreme like i think yogsron quite literally might have needed to cast player in this situation mm -hmm. dude just has a massive lead he's got ice block the, the alexstrasza got sapped back to his hand so now it's also a defensive tool although it has been dealt with and uh, he's got a second ice block in hand as well. It's almost impossible for Topo Pablo to win, even with the Yogg-Saron. Now without it, it, it's he's praying for Cabalist Tome potentially into three ice blocks if he's going to win this game. It is looking unlikely. Uh, dude, however, is one damage off lethal, so Pablo gets one more turn. Yeah. And That's can not he enough. do anything? Yeah, not enough at this point. If you cast Arcane Intellect, even if he drew Cabalist Tome in this situation, he would not have the mana left over to mm -hmm. cast uh, any defensive spells that, that are significant in this spot. So it's it's a matter of time at this point, and that's going to do it. Dude's going to wrap up game number one with a uh, with a shaky start, but a couple of fantastic pickups to answer those early minions. That's first blood. Absolutely. And really just showing the strength of the Freeze Mage pick in Conquest. I mean, we've been saying that not a lot of Freeze Mage. Tempo Mage is certainly very strong right now as well. But the players that put in so much time into the Freeze Mage and who really know it well uh, are the ones who have the most success with it. And just really fantastic play from both players in the first game. But before we get into game number two, let's get to know Dude7597 just a little bit better. Talk to me a little bit about your your life outside of Hearthstone. What do you like to do? My main passion is uh, mostly just Ultimate Frisbee. I've been playing since fifth grade. Um, in high school, I won a state championship with my high school. In college, we went to nationals last year. How was that experience? Nationals was something else. Like The field complex was massive. I think there were 40 teams there. It's a really cool experience being able to play against like some of the best players in the world. So do you think your experience with playing Ultimate Frisbee at a high level has helped with playing Hearthstone competitively? Is there any connection there? There definitely is a connection. I think the, the kind of the competitive mentality I have is similar for both. I really just love being competitive in all aspects of life. In Hearthstone, I get to do that with my mind, and in Frisbee, I get to do that with my body. Do the players on your Ultimate Frisbee team know about your your Hearthstone success? Uh, yeah, they make fun of me a lot for it, but <laughs> it's all good natured. They'll be watching this weekend. Welcome back to the America's Summer Championship. We are getting right into game number two between Dude7597 and Topo Pablo. Pablo unable to take uh, the Tempo Mage win against Dude's Freeze Mage. So Dude is, of course, up one game to zero. Uh, we are playing best of seven. So first player to four wins, of course, will take the match. So there is still plenty of time for Pablo to come back in. But admirable, Pablo was your pick to win the entire tournament. I mean, how, how does this really set up the match for him. I feel like losing that first game is, is so super important in this one because uh, Dude's first deck happened to be Freeze Mage in this. I feel like that's actually one of the weaker spots in his lineup when you compare it against Topo Pablos. Uh, and, and picking it up against Tempo Mage, you know, that's that's one where I think he's often going to find a win there. 
Um, but the, the bigger story there was just kind of showing you the, the confidence of dude in playing the matchup. You know, we saw him hard mulligan for specific tools, didn't quite pick them up, but pitching away tools that are okay in order to try to find tools that are great is what gave him that win. Tobo just fizzled out a little bit towards the middle and uh, wasn't able to keep the pressure up. Yeah, but we are going to see uh, that Tempo Mage once again on Pablo's side, and then Dude will be playing his Druid deck. And uh, the Tempo Mage actually performs pretty well against the Druid traditionally, um, if, if it gets a nice strong start. But uh, no Mana Worms here, so how do you think Dude's going to be able to sort of swing this match into his favor? Well, this is going to be an interesting turn here, because I know that one of the things that pretty much every single deck in the format struggles with is a turn one uh, Fandral. Turn one Fandral unlocks a ton of potential, and it makes the range of cards in your hand so much scarier. Dude's going to choose to be a little bit patient here with it. Um, so he's going to approach this matchup from a very different angle uh, than I think you'd see from a lot of players here. You know, his opportunity to go Fandral into Raven Idol and pick up a little bit of extra value. Fighting in this mage matchup is very much a, a matchup of value at times. So I'm curious to see exactly where he goes with this. But Topo Pablo's hand is starting to develop very nicely. He's got he's got both copies of the three twos in his deck, the, the discount spells of Sorcerer's Apprentice, the extra spell damage of Colt Sorcerer, and Mana Worm is such a key draw. Even if it's not on turn one, the, the fact that it's a one mana card that can provide so much damage is super important. Absolutely, and Dude chose not to innervate out the Fandral on one. Uh, instead, also on two, is going to be going for the Mire Keeper. Do you think maybe he just wants to save it for the later game and try to get even more value off of it? I'm curious if the Mire Keeper changes game plan at all. You know, a lot of times innervating Mire Keeper is so strong because it gives you that additional ramp and it gives you a body on board. It's a, you're kind of double dipping on this on this particular card. So if had, if Dude had not drawn that Mire Keeper, I'm curious if that would have prompted the Fandral from him instead. Um, and not going for Fandral this turn, I think, is really smart as well. Topo Pablo going into that three-man turn with Sorcerer's Apprentice means he's got access to Fireball. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got access to to, uh, to a couple of cheap spells if he wanted to play them. Maybe even like a Flame Waker turn that could uh, really swing things here. But, uh, you know, the fact that Dude is, is understanding every single card he draws affecting his game plan is really speaking a lot mm -hmm. for how he is as a player. It's a pleasure to watch him play. And uh, Topo Pablo, is, he's kind of got his work cut out for him here. He's having to just throw stuff on the board. And at this point, I'm curious if there's any option for him other than to try to protect the Man Worm with the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Now, I think I think trading here would definitely uh, be the play. And he does decide to trade the Apprentice into the Mire Keeper. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate Dude's patience in this matchup. I feel like a lot of the time we would just be tempted to innervate Coin Fandral, and then you end up getting the Raven Idol next turn. And, and uh, comboing anything with Fandral just feels really good. You want to be able to get that value. So the fact that he, he recognized that he's playing for the longer game, he is going to be uh, you know, wanting to value that Fandral even higher in the later game and yeah. instead went for the Meyer Keeper. So that, I think, is just really very evident of, of the skill level that Dude is as a player. Yeah, I, I really like that he's pacing himself. You know, it's very important in this matchup. Again, it's 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 oftentimes a resource battle. You know, you take a look at Dude's uh, Druid list specifically. He's got two copies of Power of the Wild in here alongside the Violet Teachers. He's got two copies of Ancients, the Ancient of War. He doesn't have that Malagos build that we've been seeing uh, played a lot lately. And here's where he's going to start to unlock some of this potential value. Fandral here, it's already got the job done, I'd say. It's it's very likely to pull a burn spell if Topo Pablo happens to have one here, but it's it's reloading fast. He's already got the ramp moving and just wonderful options from the Raven Idol as well. I think Dude has got a lot of gas in the tank uh, to fight this game, but Topo Pablo's hand is, is still looking pretty good. I think a lot of this is going to boil down to, to that Kabbalist Tome. And you know what? That Kabbalist Tome is going to be doing exactly what you want it to do. You want it to provide you some refill, and uh, hopefully you get something that is useful in this matchup. Another Fireball would be fantastic. Even against Druid, something like a Flame Lance or, or a Polymorph are really, really effective in this matchup. So that Kabbalist Tome potentially holding quite a bit of value. Um, and Pablo is able to just go ahead and Fireball the Fandral, get it off the board. But uh, now it's now it's dude's job to sort of react once again. You can't leave this man worm and this cult sorcerer alone. Certainly not. I mean, it looked like it's slated for Mount Raptor and Wrath. And, and I want to talk about Tofu Pablo's hand here for a minute. You kind of hit the nail on the head. Hopefully, he picked up something <laughs> off Cabal's Tome. That's the thing about that card. It's very high risk, very high reward. Um, and a lot of times, the the risk is is so great mm -hmm. because when you're spending five mana and you're not affecting the board state in a deck that's basically dedicated to keeping the board state effective, you know, this is his one real tech choice that I feel like could be a major liability to him. I mean, unless you're so far ahead on board that you essentially have a free turn to just play the Tome and still remain in that proactive position, uh, the fact that it doesn't affect the board can be really detrimental. So 
Uh, going to be interesting to see, you know, does Dude choose to sort of clear off this board and make the tome turn a little bit more awkward for Pablo? Uh, and it looks like that is what he's going to do. Yeah, but unless Topo Pablo does something super strong here, I, I imagine it's got to be Cabalist Tome. I mean, this is probably one of the strongest turns you're going to have for it. And now he's just drawn Sorcerer's Apprentice, so, uh, you know, the potential to unlock cheaper spells with it as well. He, he doesn't really have a way to take advantage of this board state at the moment, mm -hmm. so he's got to find a, a way to do that. Yeah, and I mean, there are certainly some some less than stellar options from the Tome. Uh, Shatter comes to mind. Uh, some of the secrets, Effigy, Second Cabalist uh, Tome. Tome. <laughs> it's a little slow, so th th there's definitely things that you certainly don't want to see uh, from the Tome, but you do have three cards, so more than likely you're going to get something that you can use in some way. Yeah, and it's kind of like the Freeze Mage matchup here, too. You know, it, Topo, Topo Pablo doesn't have all the time in the world. He He's the one who's typically the aggressor in this matchup. Dude, once he gets that late game, he's scaled so much that he can turn the corner very quickly, uh, be it with Violet Teacher combos, be it with just like powerful endgame spells with Ancient of War and Emperor Thorson and Nourish to Reload, uh, you know, be it with Arcane Giants. It, the world is his oyster once it gets to that late game position. And Topo Pablo, when you take all that into consideration, that's what he's deciding right now. Is he goes, you know what? I'm just not going to win a long game right mm -hmm. now. I'm going to have to draw burns spells off this Cabalist Tome, I better get these three twos developed and try to push some damage. If dude doesn't have a removal spell here, I'm likely to get through six. That's actually very well thought out by Pablo. Uh, the Tome doesn't affect the board state, so even though he only added an additional six power to the board, and uh, one of those minions is definitely going to be removed by this Mounted Raptor, the potential for six damage to face on the following turn, and then getting a little lucky off the Tome, get a couple fireballs, maybe a Pyroblast, uh, now, he, he recognized that that is his way to win the game. Now, I'm a little bit curious about this attack from Dude. I mean, Sorcerer's Apprentice, I, I think, is by far the superior minion in this deck. You know, the fact that, that Topo Pablo, right now, it's looking like he's going to need card draw to be able to get back into this game. You know, Dude just had a relatively weak turn, so that spell damage could be scaring him a little bit here. But this is Topo Pablo's turn to try to take advantage of something. And he goes for the Arcane Intellect here to try, try to dig to like, an Arcane Blast or something like that. And now he's got three more opportunities at it with this Cabalist Tome. If he manages to pick up some spells that he could cast from this this turn, he could easily snowball this game. Yeah, trading into the Cult Sorcerer instead of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, I think. Cost him a lot this turn. There's that Shatter, but he drew a Frost Nova with it. And Frost Nova Shatter is a great way to answer Ancient of War mm -hmm. in this matchup. The problem is Tobo Pablo's, since he just had a relatively weak turn as well, is mostly just reload. If dude can take advantage of that board state, that's where Tobo Pablo could be in trouble, and I think he is. Oh man, and Pablo had such a fantastic turn. He was able to use the Sorcerer's Apprentice to discount both the Tome and the Arcane Intellect, whereas if Dude had cleared off that Sorcerer's Apprentice, he would have only been able to play one of them. Um, but unfortunately, the, the three cards from the Tome are a little bit weak this time, uh, very reactive. And the the second Arcane Intellect is, is nice. I, he's going to need to dig a little bit more, but in this case, he doesn't have anything too impactful in his hand. Yeah, at this point, it's looking like he's on the burn plan. I mean, dude's hand cannot take advantage of this board state very well. It's basically the board fighting the board in this situation. What can he add behind it? And, and that's the kind of turn that Tobo Pablo is hoping that dude has in a situation like this, one where he doesn't have a massive board swing taking place. Like picture a swipe here, for instance. It would have wiped out these two minions. It would have pushed six damage from minions. It would have dealt five to his face. He'd have been in a bad board state. And now instead, it's, it's, in, a, it's in a reasonable condition. And so in this situation, if Tobo Pablo finds a lot of burn, he can win this game. If he doesn't find burn, he's in a lot of trouble. He unfortunately doesn't have any in hand, but he does have plenty of ways to find that burn. He's got the Drake, uh, the Arcane Intellect for Cycle, and then that Babbling Book is babbling a card book. that people have been pretty, you know, hit or miss on. They, they either love the Babbling Book or they're not a fan of it. Uh, you, you, of course, are saying that you like the Babbling Book. I also, I also enjoy the Babbling Book. I think it's nice to have something to play on one. Uh, That's actually shattered. Well, it's actually like pretty solid in this situation simply because the Cabal's Tome has given him a Frost Nova. If he could get to a safe board state, he can just kill two of the high priority threats from Dude. I mean, if you look at his list, two Ancients of War and two Arcane Giants are the top end right now. Of course, there's Yogg-Swan, there's Emperor Thorson. Violet Teachers need to be dealt with. The Violet Teachers getting dealt with right now. Topo Pablo's at 30, and he's got Frost Nova and two Shatters to directly answer any threat that dude can play right now. That's fantastic, oh my goodness. I don't think we've ever seen Shatter be quite as effective in competitive play than it is right now. The potential is fantastic. Uh, and dude is going to play down that Arcane Giant. 
Now, my question here is, is Tobo Pablo going to eat some of this damage, or is he going to go for that Shatter right now? If he saves that Frost Nova Shatter, he's going to be able to potentially kill a second Arcane Giant. The thing is, if he decides to go for it now, that second Shatter becomes useless, um, unless he were Outside to get that, that second Babbling Book or Frostbolt. Again, he um, wants to be using damage on face, though. He yes. doesn't want to invest it in the minions right now. It looks like he, he does definitely have the option of taking 12 damage to the face. It would put him down uh, to 14, which isn't terrible. He's definitely, uh, you know, not in risk of dying unless you consider that dude does have Yogg-Saron in hand. Um, if he recognizes that maybe Pablo does have the burn in hand necessary to kill him, uh, then potentially dude would... Wow. It's, it's, it's an interesting draw, to say the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, I imagine that that uh, Hero Power is slated this turn on the Drake. But does he want to art? Does he want to preemptively arcane blast that that arcane giant? You know, if, if he does it right now, that eight damage could very likely go to face. If he doesn't do it right now, dude has a chance to trade. And with that second Azure Drake, maybe he can then set up a kill on it. So this is a, a really interesting spot here from Topo Pablo, where where patience is what he selected. It looks like dude can just swipe the Drake and play down that second arcane giant. Oh my gosh! This Frost is exactly Nova what Topo Pablo wanted. Double shatter! Oh my goodness! This, I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is crazy. I've never seen, I've never seen this happen. This is so cool. I love it when we get to see cards that are, you know, not usually playable. Look at and, dude's reaction. Oh my goodness. Oh. The second one. That is, that is heartbreaking. I mean, this just went from dude having the game completely won to all of a sudden looking like Yogg-Saron might be his, his real win condition here. And Mulch is drawn. Dude's got two copies of Mulch in his build. Mm -hmm. He's got no copies of Feral Rage. Yeah. The life he's playing with, and that's that's it. And Power of the Wild gets drawn. He's going to try to reload this board. This is right into Flame Strike. Tobo Pablo has destroyed Dude's pressure now. Oh my goodness. Pablo could take advantage of that Flame Strike. He also has the option, if he wants to get that Drake down, Arcane Blast would clear off that Azure Drake very easily. And then uh, Forgotten Frostbolt. Torch Frostbolt. Oh my goodness, the Pablo. Is just assembling all the pieces he needs. The damage is is very much there now. It's a very realistic possibility. Arcane Intellect and, and Flame Strike will clear out the board and continue to dig. He's got Ar Azure Drake plus a couple of burn spells that he could use to take to handle the next threat that's played. I mean, do? if Dude doesn't draw anything significant do? next turn, he, there's a chance he plays Yogg-Saron. and that's not the position he wants to be in right now. When the board is clear, it's not a very favorable mm -hmm. Yogg-Saron. And Tobo Pablo looks like he wants to get this Drake on board. He has seen a swipe at this point. So this will also enable the Arcane Blast on that Azure Drake immediately. Save that Flame Strike for a little bit later. Yeah, it's very rare that you see uh, a Yogg-Saron when you are ahead on board. You don't want to offensively Yogg-Saron. Usually it's 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 a defensive player, something to close out the game. Um, especially wow. since, if, oh my goodness, Pablo just going four damage right to the face with that Forgotten Torch, and that, that puts the Roaring Torch into his deck. And think about what that says to do to this point. Your, your opponent has a 3-2 on board. You have a 4-4 Azure Drake. They're at 16. You're at 16. They deal four damage to your face. Dude has got to be terrified of to Topo Pablo's range right mm -hmm. now. If it's just fireballs, the game could end. We did see the first fireball on the fan roll. Here we go. Well, that's, that's, I mean, it wasn't good in Priest. It's not good in Druid. Uh, the Innervate, though, is not bad, actually. That's a decent draw. Uh, that's not what he needed. Silvermoon Portal doesn't want to buff that Drake. It buffs the Drake. Oh, no. Living Roots making 1-1s. One this is right into Flame Strike, too. Now, that it does extend a little bit outside of Flame Strike. Thistle T. Oh, my. Oof. If Dude manages to get through this turn, it's significant. My question is, does he get through this turn? If he only had one more mana right now, Mulch on that Drake would be fantastic. But he just did not get the clears that he needed from that Yogg. And uh, that Hunter Secret, though, could potentially make some oh, of a difference. He picks up a Mulch from the Raven Idol. That's so huge right now to be able to deal with the Azure Drake. This means that Tobo Pablo is going to be committed to dealing with this board presence. And suddenly saving that Flame Strike looks like it's so strong for him right now.
Uh, yeah, Innervate Raven Idol into the second Innervate to be able to play the mulch. Gave him that one extra mana that he needed. And now Dude has a phenomenal, a phenomenal board presence. Oh my the goodness. The phenomenal the phenom I did that yesterday too, <laughs> didn't I? Oh man, now this is just turning into a habit. That's dangerous. Yeah. Um, so Dude very much happy to see a commit of damage to the board, but very unhappy to see the flame strike afterwards. And in this situation, I'm actually curious if, if we're going to see Dude up a nation of war here. I mean, he has to deliver a final blow and he has to do it now. That that hunter secret he has up is bear trap. It's okay. not providing him any sort of real defense at the moment. And again, he's got to be scared that Tobo Pablo has enough damage in hand. I think we're seeing an uproot here. Oh my goodness. That would force out uh, the fireball or the roaring torch onto uh, the 10 5 Ancient yeah. of War. And he's happy to see. I don't think it necessarily does force it. Oh, and yes. And that's the thing. This dude would be happy to see burn mm -hmm. on this Ancient of War right now. He's got two that's more in his want. hand. Oh my god, Thistle Tea. What a card, am I right? This is not bad. And that's, that, an Arcane Missile's not the damage he's looking for right now. It's, it's it, unreliable at best. I will not be trifled with. All right, so, Naga uh, Sea Witch. The Fireball costs five, but that's fine. He wasn't likely gonna play the missiles anyway. He hasn't seen a single Flame Waker for Pablo. Here's the thing, this is a mistake from Topo Pablo, and here's why. That Thistle Tea that got cast, he could track the cards in hand and see where that mm -hmm. Ancient War came from. He would know that dude has two more copies of Ancient of War in hand right now. That that uh, Naga Sea Witch is dead to a second of Ancient War right now. Yeah. Now dude can just play defense. He's seen a fireball so he can feel safe a little bit. There's no way that five damage is getting through. But what other option did Pablo really have there? He could have just tried intellect. to cycle. And, yeah. yeah, I think I think you dig for the win here. He's got a copy of Roaring Torch in his deck. He still has uh, another Forgotten Torch alongside mm -hmm. a Frostbolt. I mean, he could have realistically found the damage here. And with a 10-5 with a Ancient of War, it means that Flame Waker could actually deliver some damage yeah. here as well. Yeah, and in this case, the Naga Sea Witch is essentially useless. It's like you're putting nothing on the board because you're not going to be able to clear the Ancient of War with it. You're not going to be able to hit face. So the cycle would have... I'm really Likely interested that, that dude doesn't feel comfortable just playing another Ancient of War here. I mean, he's seen all the Cabalist Tome cards. He knows that there's not a Polymorph mm -hmm. inside of uh, inside of Topo Pablo's deck. The only way he could get a Polymorph effect right now is is the second Babbling Book into uh, into the catalog spell. It makes a second uproot Ancient of War, and Topo Pablo, that Flame Waker draw is hot like fire. That Flame Waker and that right mirror on image time. image is so good. And there's that Frostbolt. Okay, so he does have some more burn left in the deck. He has to clear off this Ancient of War, though. So the, the mirror, mirror image, image just, it's isolating it. And the missiles, it, oh my goodness. I think this is another Arcane Intellect here. Now, it depends if he wants to clear the Ancient of War or not. I mean, something that could realistically kill him here is, is a spell power and a swipe. But I mm -hmm. believe he's seen both Azure Drakes at this point. He will just select a clear, and that's going to mean Frostbolt to the dome. Oh my goodness. Two more points of damage. Tobo Pablo is closing in on the win here. How does... It's no help. <sighs> All right, so you play your Ancient of War, uh, 510 Taunt, you Hero Power, you're at 5 health, and Pablo needs either that's some rare. direct burn or several spells to be able to hit face. Oh, oh wow. my goodness. Second Flame Waker, Arcane Intellect. I mean, even without the second Flame Waker, Topo Pablo is massively favored once he gets to this spot. And I was just saying, we hadn't seen do it. those Flame Wakers, but coming in right in handy. And Roaring Torch, Forgotten Torch, Pablo has an embarrassment of riches to be able to finish out this game. And Topo Pablo is going to tie up this series one-to-one, -one, uh, taking out Dude's Druid deck. That was... A fantastic match, really just swinging from, from both sides very quickly. Uh, the game changed several times, but uh, I mean, Pablo was not always in a fortunate position. How do you think it really ended up coming down? I mean, that, that Cabal's Tome and two Shatters alongside the Frost Nova is, is really what made a big difference there. You know, being able to deliver a, f a finishing blow on two Arcane Giants in one single turn, that's never what Druid's looking for. Absolutely. But before we get into game number three, let's hear what Topo Pablo has to say about becoming the first Latin American player to potentially qualify for BlizzCon. How was it the feeling like when you qualified for the championship? Well, momento más feliz. O sea, por fin se vieron mis frutos de todo el esfuerzo que le puse al juego. Porque muchas veces uno como player eh, juega, juega, juega y no recibe nada. Entonces, ese momento fue mi, la recompensa. Entonces, estaba demasiado feliz. 
What's the esports and Hearthstone scene like in, in Latin America? Ahí estoy seguro. Voy a ser el primer latinoamericano en clasificar a la BlizzCon. Y eh, respecto a, lo, digamos, a la comunidad, si sí hay muchos players buenos. El punto es que creo que en los torneos Open yo veo muy poco latino. Así que yo creo que ese es el punto que hay que tratar de mejorar, que la gente se meta más a los torneos para llegar a esta instancia. You were talking earlier about how uh, you think that the Latin American esports scene needs to be more encouraging. Um, what would you say to sort of players and people in esports to sort of encourage them to uh, be more involved in esports and take Hearthstone more seriously? Um, bueno, principalmente yo creo que para que la escena crezca, eh, los managers de los teams deberían eh, informarse del juego, digamos, conocer lo que está pasando. Siempre generalmente se conoce el resto de los juegos y hay que darle importancia a Hearthstone, la importancia que se, que se debe. able to take his first win of the series with his Tempo Mage deck. Both mages are off the table, and uh, now Dude still has to get a win with that Druid. So really just fantastic with that Tempo Mage. And I even called it. I'm like, you know, Shatter from Kabbalah Stone. It's okay. It's not great. And, and in this case, because of the Frost Nova, just won the game for him. That was fantastic. A, a, pre a pretty prime example of the high risk, high reward mm -hmm. that Kabbalah Stone can provide. I mean, when it works, it's, it's incredible but it really doesn't work that often. It's just, when it does, it's a massive payoff. And so now it's gonna be Dude on his aggressive Shaman build versus Topo Pablo. And looking at Dude's Shaman uh, a little bit more close, uh, sorry, looking at uh, Topo Pablo's uh, Druid a little bit more closely here, it is, it's uh, very, very similar to what we saw from Dude's list. Uh, the major difference being that there's one copy of Mulch and one copy of Feral Rage rather than two copies of Mulch in here. So that does benefit him, I think, slightly in this matchup. But overall, he's at a pretty significant disadvantage. This is this is very much an uphill battle for him. You know what? Both players actually have reasonably nice hands. Pablo had the living roots on one. He's got the wild growth, um, plenty of ramp. But dude's hand is just it's fantastic right now. He has uh, both the tunnel trog and the Argent squire, two three drops, uh, some removal. Really just a fantastic hand for the aggro shaman. So Pablo, like you said, going to have a very uphill battle in this case. Yeah, uh, the, the Ancients of War really do make a big difference in this matchup. And that's really the one thing to point out, is a lot of the Malagos versions tend to struggle with shaman because they don't really have a stabilizing tool. It's, I mean, they're reliant on yuxarot. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's got two copies of Ancient of War, and we're seeing an early ramp into it. Uh, Violet Teacher is a threat that shaman oftentimes uh, does have to pay some attention to, but dude's opener with with the Tunnel Trog here, and now uh, the options at his disposal, this is where Topo Pablo can really struggle. He doesn't have the early removal spells that handle this board, and so Ancient of War, rather than being a stabilizing tool, might actually end up acting as a, a removal tool instead, and that's not the situation that Topo Pablo wants to be in. Absolutely, the Druid has a fair amount of removal uh, on their own. They've got, you know, obviously Swipe, Wrath. Uh, we only see one copy of Mulch in Pablo's deck, whereas Dude has two. But that Feral Rage can also be used for some early removal on uh, something like the Totem Golem or the Tunnel Trog. So the fact that he doesn't have any of that in hand is, uh, you know, putting him at a disadvantage. Tunnel Trog, Coin, Feral Spirits. Yeah, it's definitely a tough spot for, for Topo Pablo early on. And Dude, he's debating over the trade here. If he chooses to trade, uh, it kind of cuts into Topo Pablo's ability to actually answer this board state. Um, and it also strengthens you a little bit when you see uh, something like Violet Teacher and you feel you may actually want to answer this right away. Um, so does have the option to, to answer it, and it would have meant he got a little bit of extra value at the, at the Tunnel Trog if he chooses to use the Tunnel Trog here. But the other thing it does is it takes away Topo Pablo's ability to, say, do something like like a second Wild Growth and use Hero Power, or a Wrath and use Hero Power, trade in both of those saplings. Uh, restricting Topo Pablo's options means that he's going to have a tougher time handling the board. Do you want to overload this turn? You don't have the Flame Reef Faceless in hand, but uh, potentially uh, you could draw it on the following turn. And overloading this turn gives you a stronger board state now, but it does restrict your options for the following turn. So do you think that's really a big deal, or would you have liked to see something else played this turn? I think I think I like where Dude's headed with this right now. I mean, again, it's just his three-cost cards are so strong at the moment. Uh, Feral Spirit, I think, is one of the stronger cards versus Druid in general, unless it turns into like a minion-on-minion-style minion fight. 
Um, but Tusker Totemic is, is just great in the same regard. He has the high roll potential there. And, you know, if he, if he finds one of those three important totems, it's a big deal. But it's really all on Topo Pablo's shoulders right now. I mean, the Ancient of War is looking like it's falling into a bad state when you look at the board position because it's going to be matching up pretty darn well versus an Ancient of War. And this is a one mana card. It's already done massive work and it could potentially do even more. And uh, okay, oh, so Doomhammer Doom Hammer comes added. into hand. That makes this turn a little bit more difficult because uh, while the Feral Spirits would put significant board presence and boost that Tunnel Trog up to six attack, it does restrict his options for next turn. So he could go with the Tuskar Totemic. Uh, which one do you like better here? Well, all the ramp has certainly got to be uh, making Dude consider what's going on here. I think I'd like to see the Tuskar Totemic into the Doom Hammer. I mean, Feral Spirits is basically always going to be good. Tusker Totemic might not always be good, but he's favoring the extra damage here that he's getting from the Feral Spirits as well. So kind of playing both angles of, of the attack at this point. And uh, we'll see if it's going to end up working out. I mean, Tobo Pablo, like I said, he wants to use Ancient War as a stabilizing tool, not a removal tool. It's good enough, but he's staring down a six power Tunnel Trog. If there's a Flame Tongue Totem on the other side of the board, if there's a big Overload spell, that's where Tobo Pablo could be in trouble. But he's already seen both Feral Spirits. He knows that he's overloaded for two, so he can't flame wreath faceless. I mean, at this point, it's basically lava burst mm -hmm. or it's flame tongue totem. And and we've seen Tobo Pablo when he can't play around cards, he hasn't even tried to at this point. And that's that's something I really like about his gameplay is is he's understanding where he's at in the game. Yeah, absolutely. And he did have the option of uh, playing the Violet Teacher, could have wrathed the uh, Tunnel Trog and gotten it off the board, but that would have you know, not affected the board state as well as he wants to at this point. He needs to prevent damage and he needs to remove this board in some way, shape or form. So the the best option for him uh, would be if Dude were to have to trade off uh, the Tunnel Trog and two of the Feral Spirit Wolves. But uh, we'll see. Oh my gosh, that oh is my huge. Goodness. All right, well, that is exactly what Dude needed to be able to save some of his board and push even more damage. Seven mana card eaten by half of a three mana card and a one mana card. Not the situation you want to find yourself in. Now, a second Wrath gets picked up. Is there a turnaround potential here? I mean, Dude's hand is super strong right now, but this is about to be a massive push onto the board. It's definitely possible, especially because that Feral Rage doesn't just have to be four attack on your hero, it could also be eight health. So that could potentially be the stabilizer that he needs. I think this turn you just want to go ahead and remove as much as possible from the board, but uh, if dude next turn were to have Doomhammer Rockbiter, it would be all over. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, is I don't think Tobo Pablo can really play around that. I think if he sees Doomhammer Rockbiter, he's out of this game. Uh, he doesn't have another taunt in hand. Even if he gains eight life right now, he's gonna be taking 17 damage from that swing right now from 21. He'll go to four facing a Doom Hammer. I don't think that Feral Rage is slated this turn. I think he's got to try to cut into the damage and hope he doesn't see that uh, that big end game push that, that dude is looking for because the Shaman end game comes much earlier than the other decks end games <laughs> typically do. So he's trying to decide, does he want to Feral Rage defensively or does he want to uh, presumably Wrath away at the Tuscar Totemic because it does represent the most damage Yep, I, I like wrapping it off here and, and hoping that you don't see the, the top end of Dude. I think this is his best chance to win. Oh, man. And is Dude even afraid of this Violet Teacher at this point, or does he just... <laughs> not anymore. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he may, oh, he may, you may see a trade on, on a couple of the one ones here to try to restrict board options, but that would be, I think, the most that he's willing to commit at this point. I mean, he still may Lava Burst here. I mean, the Doomhammer is going to be good on the next turn as well. And, and if he goes Tunnel Trog here, he gets the Lava Burst and play two other things. So he does have that option, but I think here the damage push is just too strong to ignore. Wow, so Dude is going to be able to deal eight damage to Pablo's face. He can Feral Rage on the following turn, but that Lava Burst is just representing too much. Ooh, swipe. Does the swipe do it it definitely helps i mean swipe cuts all the damage off the board and then he goes to uh 13 from the feral rage mm -hmm. and then he goes to 14 from the hero power here and dude has got nine damage showing with lava burst and doom hammer up to 11 with finley into steady shot this is where topo pablo can try to make a push here it has to be now he's gonna have to draw a defensive tool but it's a possibility Let's see, following this, what can he do? He does have Raven Idol, so that could potentially give him something like Healing Touch. He's at the uh, mercy of his draws. It's, it's, it's very tough, but he does have the potential to come back into this game. Dude is looking at a two-turn lethal right now, uh, potentially. And that's, so, that's if nothing gets picked up. Yes. And Thing From Below is a great pickup when there's no cards in the opposing hand and they only have five power out. I mean, here you could realistically 
uh, see a single trade onto a minion to be able to, to force through that thing from below and make sure it sticks unless Tobo Pablo picks up something or unless he's willing to take five damage to finish off that thing from below. Everything is spelling dude this game. Yeah, Pablo just, just you know, was, was looking like he had the potential, but uh, I was man. trying to think of a dead draw that that, that dude, dude could have even like had. Abusive Sergeant, maybe. You know, another yeah. Argent Squire. Everything else in the deck is pretty darn good at this point. You know, Lightning Storm would have been nice. Flame Tongue Totem. Every, Lightning Storm, it, it would handle the board pressure, mm -hmm. too. I mean, just everything is coming up dude this game. I mean, he doesn't have really a bad draw in the deck. And you know what? That's what the aggro shaman wants to. It wants to position itself well, especially in a matchup against the druid. If they don't get that early removal, then uh, the aggro shaman it just doesn't have a lot of dead draws in the late game. When you need a couple points of damage, you're very likely to get it. Now, all right, I want to see tree of life. So, <laughs> fortunately, it's not in the format <laughs> know, anymore. Starfire is good here. It. Nourish. It, it's ah. okay. it's his best option. It's okay. I think he's got to find something to dig here. I'm thinking Starfire, Moonglade Portal were probably two of the better options mm -hmm. he could have picked up at this point, but. Um, this, this, these next three draws, these, these will likely decide whether or not Topo Pablo is, is losing this game or if he's extending it a little bit. Swipe There's will extend swipe. it. And Arcane Giant. Thank you, Arcane Giant, for being our Yogg-Saron on spell counter. <laughs> you can see that Arcane Giant discounted from 12 to 2. Each spell discounts it, so that is a 10 spell Yogg potential here. 4, 9, once again, 11 damage available from Dude, unless he got, like, life tap into mm -hmm. something else. And outside of that, Topo Pablo is is almost committed to playing Yogg Saron in the following turn. He's been seeing dude hold cards in his hand the entire game. You know, he's got to anticipate that this is this is in the neighborhood of Argent Horse Rider, of, of another lightning bolt. You know, wh what else could those cards be? Maybe a lightning storm even. Mm -hmm. Topo Pablo, I think, from his perspective, has got to believe that that's damage available in dude's hand. Oh, wow. And dude actually chose to go for the totem before playing the Finley. Um, oh, fine oh. shapeshift. Is that enough to close it? That's so, six and then five with the no, Lava Burst. No, so it's 11 total mm -hmm. this game, this turn. And this will mean Yogg Saron for Topo Pablo. Unless, oh, my goodness. Unless it's a, just an insane pickup, which he doesn't have any of the deck right now that are that insane. So it's almost certainly a Yogg Saron turn. My, my question is, should he play Yogg Saron prior to attacking and try to get damage buffs on his minions to maybe deliver a final blow? It's always so tough to tell. I mean, you could get uh, something like Savage War, Bloodlust, um, anything can happen to buff your board and you know, attempt to just kill your opponent that yeah. turn. Every, everything is awesome. That's the one. I was trying to remember everything the Everything is yeah. awesome. Ah. I, I mean, it's got to be Yogg. There's, yeah, there's no question it has to be Yogg. He even gets an Innervate prior to it. So Arcane it's Hero Giant, Power. Innervate Yogg. Hero, Hero Power, Power Innervate, Innervate Yogg. Yeah, I think that's the play here. Oh my goodness. So we're looking at an 11 spell Yogg Saron. Um, what do you think? Do you do you choose to hit face? Do you trade minions, or, I, or do you decide to save and go for that lethal push? Look, at this point, I'm surprised that we're even in this game. If I'm Topo Pablo, I, I'm going for the lethal here. I'm going to, to buff my minions and, and hope that I can deliver that final blow. I, I think it's the correct call. <sighs> oh, man. Well, hopefully for Pablo, the first card isn't Twisting Nether, uh, now, I, but we'll see. I wouldn't mind seeing some attacks in the form of these minions, but I, I think clearing off the... Uh, the tunnel trout here was was a little bit risky. We'll see where this game ends up going. So no attacks available for Topo Pablo. No decisions left to make. Let's see where this pans out. Polymorph boar. So that that boar is dead in some capacity. An ice, ice block. block. Cat trick. Hellfire. So board is cleared. Topo Pablo's at four. He can no longer heal though because of Embrace the Shadows. Sets himself to one with quick shot. But and healing touch will not heal him. It will kill. Oh my goodness. Second he gets a on the hand. Yug. Gang up in the deck. He is not dead. And he, now he has the ice block, so dude cannot kill him this turn. He's going to pop the block, and that might set up Pablo for a second Yogg Saron next turn. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe. This is insane. This is happening right now. But, but here's the thing, dude, because uh, Cat Trick is playing on Pablo's side. So if dude plays one of his spells, then Pablo puts 11 damage okay. on board. Hero power is 12. If dude plays either of these spells, even with the hero power, He's just dead. Well, he, here's the thing. So he pops the ice block. He can kill Yogg Saron with the Lava Burst, which I definitely think is slated this turn. Mm -hmm. Tobo Pablo then has four damage on board, five with the hero power. That's if Yogg Saron gets killed this turn. If he doesn't kill Yogg Saron, it's seven damage instead. So then he's dead to a swipe draw. Yes. He's dead to, uh, to, to some of the Raven Idol spells that can be drawn here. He's already seen Feral Rage, but if he's not considering Feral Rage, he may think that he's, he's dead to that. You know, if Topo Pablo, mm -hmm. if he if he draws into into a living roots and uh, and um, 
I'm trying to think of another damage spell that would actually the kill this point. The thing is, he, he's got to be so hesitant to give mm -hmm. up his direct damage um, because of the potential of something like an Ancient of War draw from <sighs> Pablo. That's a big point. That's a very big point to make. <laughs> but oh, he, he, he has to Lava Burst the Yogster on if he wants to live. Otherwise, well, well, Catrick's not proccing if he doesn't cast a yes, spell. Yes, Catrick so. doesn't proc if he draws a spell, but and, and Pablo's played both swipes already. So second Raven Idol uh, could do it. Lava Burst, and there's the four right. damage. And and here, I would love to see Topo Pablo, if he's going to play Yogg on, which I, unless he draws something lights out, mm -hmm. he has to do. That is definitely another Yogg Saron. Oh, my goodness. He is at one health. Oh, my gosh. He's, this you got to go for it. And this is it. <laughs> this is... It's 11 spell Yogg Saron. He can still attack. Bloodlust gets cast. That's so four damage off. I'm sorry, five damage off lethal. Oh, Wind Fury goodness. is that onto the cat? No. It's not the right target. Anything can happen. Finley's hey, no good Finley. right now. <gasps> is it a Huffer? No, it's a Leoc. But that's more damage. Does the Wrath go in the... Oh, <gasps> my God! Oh, oh my, my gosh! God. He needs he needs one point of damage to make this happen. I'm sorry, two points two of points. damage. Two points of damage will make this happen. Oh my goodness. He doesn't get there, it's, and that's it. Because dude has the rock fighter in hand. Dude wow. has 10 damage plus two with the hero power. Oh my goodness. What an insane game that we're seeing in game number three here. <laughs> dude manages to live through two Yogg-Sarons for 11 spells each and takes a 2-1 lead. And look at the stress on dude's face. Look at Tobo Pablo. He's like smiling and having a good time. Dude looks stressed out right now. Admirable, as if it couldn't get any better than Kabbalah Stone and Babbling Book for two Shatters and a Frost Nova. We just had two 11 spell Yogg-Sarans and dude still came out on top. That was, that was insane. Looking at the demeanors, you would think that dude lost this game. And the thing about it is, if you look back to preliminaries, dude's dreams were almost doused mm -hmm. by a Yogg-Saron from Monsanto, a five-spell Yogg-Saron that was an insurmountable lead afterwards. The fact that he just faded to, oh my gosh. All right, well, well, the players get a chance to cool off between the games. Let's uh, take a look at how dude values his practice partners. There's a lot of people that sort of play by themselves when they play Hearthstone. What's the value of having players to practice with and to bounce ideas off of. I think part of the reason I got good at Hearthstone is just from kind of picking the brains of pro players on my friends list, just asking people like Amnesiac and Muzzy and Astro, just a ton of questions. How did you find these these practice partners that you eventually became really close with? Um, I kind of just became friends with them on Battle.net through various ways, like either I play someone on ladder and just add them afterwards because I recognize their name or uh, like Astro I played in an open tourney and then I don't know why he didn't delete me because uh, I don't know I wasn't that good back then we talked some more and became pretty good friends and Muzzy I also played in an open tourney one of the best players in the world what type of play style do you think you have are you a risky player are you a safe player I think I err on the side of being risky I tend to go for the uh, risky play with a large payoff Some absolutely fantastic games so far, and this is only the first match of the day, Admirable. I mean, can it really even get better than this? Well, I mean, we could have seen, uh, you know, five Yogg Sarans that game, maybe. That's true, that's We true. just went along and they just kept getting ice blocks over and over again. I mean, there were three more <laughs> in the deck from the gang up, so it, it was possible. Um, but Dude did manage to come out on top in game number three, putting him at a two to one lead over Topo Pablo. And Admirable, I know Pablo is your pick to take it all, and he is down one game right now. Do you think he can actually come back from this? Uh, I, I, I mean, obviously he can. Uh, the, shaman, the Shaman win here for Dude, I think, was, was um, it's a significant win, but not quite as significant, I think, as, as say, if Dude picked up a win with, with either Druid or Warrior. Uh, you know, Druid is kind of, I'd say, the next soft spot in Dude's lineup where uh, where the, the face-off is concerned with Topo Pablo. Topo Pablo has Druid, Shaman, and Hunter remaining. Um, all three of those decks can can perform versus Druid. You know, the Druid matchup, it's, it's a toss-up of, of who basically mm -hmm. comes on top of that one. I think Dude has an edge with two mulches in the build. Uh, but Hunter and Shaman are going to perform very well on average versus Druid. And so that's the matchup we're seeing to start here. And uh, Topo Pablo's hand, it's lacking that early game but he's got a lot of strong tools 
to get this going right now. Dude kept a, kept an innervate in his opening hand, it looked like, and a copy of Swipe. He's not going to have any pressure for a little bit, um, but that's not really so important. He's trying mm -hmm. to be the, uh, the the control deck for a while until he finds the right spot to turn the corner. Yeah, I'm sure Dude's actually just, just very happy not to see something like uh, an Argent Squire, a Fiery Bat on one. Um, when the Hunter is able to curve out starting from turn one, they have very, very strong board presence. Uh, Pablo does pick up that huge toad on two. So mid-range Hunter has sort of been in a strange place lately where it's been, you know, it's been a good deck. Um, but in a lot of cases, it hasn't been considered good enough until you bring a five deck lineup to a tournament. Um, so how do you think the Hunter is is going to play out in Pablo's lineup? Yeah, it's more of a hybrid version that he's brought here. It's aptly named Pitbull. After, <laughs> he named him after the uh, the animals that he has. And so he's got a copy of Argent Squire, two copies of Fiery Bat, one copy of Abusive Sergeant, and then kind of sort of the uh, the mid-cost minions you would expect here. Uh, you know, like Huge Toad, a copy of Direwolf Alpha in here, Kindly Grandmother. Um, and then just kind of scales throughout the game. The thing that's really interesting to note is that there's one Eagle Horn Bow and one Argent Commander and one Deadly Shot. Everything else is kind of dedicated more uh, towards that, those later game scenarios. And Barnes here, it's here's the thing. It's it's less likely to be good when you have a couple yes. of the uh, weaker minions in your deck. And he did draw Savannah Jaime in this turn. So Savannah Jaime an important draw. But, the, you know, getting Savannah Jaime from Barnes is, that's really like the super big... The pinnacle. Yeah, it's, it's like the... It's, it's the one giant uh, power play that they can have from a random mm -hmm. effect. And his hand is developing nicely afterwards, though. You know, the fact that, uh, that Unleash the Hounds isn't, isn't like too dead of a tool in this matchup because dude's playing a, a more token version. Yeah, Pablo's got some really nice turns coming up, but that Raven Idol draw for Dude was pretty important. Uh, it's going to make his Fandral turn. Um, he's going to be able to utilize all of his mana oh, instead of so just playing off. the Drake. That is very interesting. Uh, Sogolf is actually pretty good in this matchup. I mean, if you can manage to get that on board, mm -hmm. Deadly Shot's really the only card that yeah. kills it. You know, it's not ki getting kill commanded. You know, it's, it requires a lot of minion damage to push through, and with having five power on the front end, I mean, it's like that's like a third mm -hmm. agent of war for a dude. That was a really nice Raven Idol. Usually the minions can be very hit or miss, and in this case, Sogolf wow. the Slitherer, really, really nice. And that next swipe, so that's going to add some really much needed uh, removal to dude's hand, and maybe even some, some staying power uh, in the late game. Yeah, I'm curious to see if Topo Pablo goes for the abuse of Sergeant here, or the hero power. You know, if you look at his next couple turns, Savannah High Main slated for the turn after uh, his turn seven, he could very well draw a minion or just anything to couple alongside the Eagle Horn bow he already has, and he's rolling into Call of the Wild. I think his goal right now is just to create the strongest board state he possibly mm -hmm. can. Yeah, even though a lot of the times, if you do have two mana remaining, you want to sort of weave in those hero powers to try to extend your damage as much as possible. But in this case, uh, the board state, if the uh, Abusive Sergeant does remain on the board for next turn, represents two more damage. So it just has, has the potential to be uh, even more effective. So, and I do believe Pablo credited his Hunter deck to Frozen. Uh, he said that he had been trying several different builds and this was just the one that he liked best. Yep. So it is a little bit unique, but uh, we're seeing it play out and it's working really well. Frozen in a very similar lineup to what Topo Pablo has did uh, win uh, the a, a championship at PAX mm -hmm. a couple weeks back uh, with all the cards and kerosene in the mix. And here, going to choose to ignore the Violet Teacher and just develop Svein Hymen. And that's largely in part because of that Unleash the Hounds. And with the Direwolf Alpha even in there, it means that he could check a, a Power of the Wild turn here from Dude as well. And if Dude manages, happens to go wide on board this turn, you could be seeing a disastrous turnaround for Dude in this matchup. I mean, kind of looking at the tools and the way they line up, you can see why the Hunter is considered favor in the, uh, in the Druid matchup. Absolutely. And what are dude's options this turn, really? You know, you were saying he, he wants to avoid going wide because of the potential of Unleash the Hounds, but does he have a way to clear this board and put himself in a favorable position without doing so? Yeah, it's what the Sogoth is for here, is uh, to try to create this board state. Uh, but Savannah Hymane is so powerful versus minions just like this. The fact that you get to deliver a six damage blow and keep something around afterwards, keep two things around afterwards, uh, it's it's the kind of situation that can spell trouble. And for Dude here, if he kills that Infested Wolf, you know, he's beginning to make a little bit of progress, but then he's not being the aggressor. And Dude needs to find a way to turn the corner. And right now, it's just looking like that's not available. How can he best put himself in a good position? He does have Azure Drake Swipe coming up. Uh, that spell damage swipe will be really, really nice in clearing off the hyenas as well as the death rattle from the infested wolf. But Pablo is in a dominant position once he clears off this Sogoth, which he can do really easily. Do you think this is already a, a pretty good hound's turn? I mean, 
I'm curious if he feels that way. I mean, he does have plenty of options for, for clearing off this Sogoth, and so just whichever one he thinks is going to be best here. You know, I'd say Unleash the Hounds is probably one of the weaker cards in his hand, um, so he may choose to use that simply for for uh, the ease of using it, but if he chooses to go with Eagle Horn Bow here, it probably means he's not using Unleash the Hounds. I mean, I, I would say Eagle Horn Bow is a pretty strong tool in his hand mm -hmm. even. You know, Unleash the Hounds in, in coupled with, with Dire Wolf Alpha here could get the job done, but he feels like it's just enough, like it, that he can pay life right now. And I think Dude is pretty happy to see him pay life for this moment. And again, he's looking for an opportunity to turn the corner here. Pablo can choose to clear off that Violet Teacher if he decides to play out the Argent Horse Rider and trade in the Infested Wolf as well. I think, I think it's giddy up. At this point, you know, he can push five damage to set Dude to 15 <laughs> and roll into Call of the Wild with four minions already on board. Two of them are tough to deal with. I think this is Tobo Pablo's uh, turn to, to try to take advantage of that. He certainly has a really nice board state and that Eagle Horn Bow attached. Uh, Call of the Wild representing five damage from Huffer and an additional four uh, from the minions being buffed that are already on the board. So dude needs to do something. He does not have access to that Azure Drake swipe yet. Could pick up an Innervate off Raven Idol. You know, he's surprisingly close to, to lethal here sometimes too. I mean, with, with a Savage War pickup, he's three damage off of lethal. And none of those are very good right now. Those are, those are atrocious looking options. Oh for dude. man. What can he do? Nourish is very slow. Force of nature is ineffective, and savagery doesn't do anything. Not at the moment, it doesn't. I think I think that's mm -hmm. it. I mean, dude, he may not die this next turn. He may. I mean, he can still find a way. I think to to live through pressure, but it's kind of the nail in the coffin. Like the pressure at that point will be almost insurmountable. He'd have to draw intervate, oh, and he'd have to have a favorable Yogg-Sarath. I mean, I say that, I guess he does yeah. a swipe, but I assume he's using the swipe here mm -hmm. is where my uh, sentiment was going. Yeah, that's really a shame because he, he did want to save it and get the most value with the Azure Drake uh, spell damage, but savagery. <laughs> you know what? Hey, savagery, definitely the best of, uh, the lesser of the evils in this case. Uh, he decides to, yep, clear both off the board. It's actually not that strong of a call the wild turn either, if you really look at it. This is actually a good setup from Dude. I, I'm surprised he spotted something this strong with those options available. You know what? That's why he's sitting in that chair, and it's uh, he certainly earned it, and he's a very strong ladder player. And, and we did touch mostly on um, how his freeze mage skill is very high, but also just very well-rounded in every class. Um, it's got to be called the wild turn. <laughs> but, at, trying to find any other way to not, to not I mean, call the wild turn. I could see Hound's direwolf alpha, but then you're... you're Clear you off are the just Violet really teacher. expending so much damage yeah. into trading. Let's clear off the Violet Teacher, I think, here, and, and push for five. I mean, he may still go he, face here. I mean, if he could just push for eight. Counting his damage is going to be paramount here. Like, how much do you need to squeeze out of the uh, of, of this hand next turn? You know, six of the mana would be committed if he played Tracking on the Hats and Direwolf mm. Alpha. It'd leave him three mana left over. So that's one hero power and a one cost card. Yeah, I think clearing off the Violet Teacher here is slated. Make Misha tough to deal with. You just saw a swipe. Forced you to have something right here. You have to take into account that Unleash the Hounds plus Dire Wolf does represent a fair amount of damage. So if Dude does go wider on board and doesn't have anything to taunt, then, you know, that could be the finishing blow that you need. But in this case, Call of the Wild is just DG's so one swipe good. this turn. DG's one swipe this game. Mm -hmm. So Azure Drake into swipe is probably his best chance to actually win. Uh, he... No, he actually used the second one on Barnes on turn four. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So he doesn't have that option available to him. If that, and if that's not an option, I'm curious how he gets out of this. Like maybe Nourish into Wrath clear off the uh, the Huffer with the tokens that you have remaining. But and that's when that's when mm -hmm. the hero power starts to check things here. Yeah. And, and Pablo's hand coupled. is Pablo's hand is weak going forward, but he doesn't really need any more of those yeah, cards. His hand's kind of just strong enough. And and that's a that's not the situation you want to be in when your opponent's hand is weak and but it's still good enough. Now so the swipe was he from a Raven. He pulled Idol. it from the Raven Idol. So, that is what it was, yeah. And with what's the funny is if he would have cast Azure Drake, he actually would have drawn this swipe. So the swipe here still lets, lets him clear off the Huffer. So the percentage actually, I think, is in benefit of using the Nourish here instead. The trade-off is is what kind of pressure he ends up getting here. And because he picked up the Living Roots and the Innervate, it means he gets the Arcane Giant as the pressure. So the, once again, Dude has found the absolute best scenario for him with the tools available. He's not going for the obvious mm -hmm. uh, decent play. He's looking deeper, and he's finding a great play to couple with it. How much damage is that? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine damage. All right, so Pablo can track into potentially a kill command. Um, 
Man, this is this is really just speaking volumes about the the quality of the players we have. Dude, taking his time every turn to find the absolute best possible play. Kill command here wouldn't even be lethal. That's the thing. He doesn't have the mana to use everything. So this is a, this is actually like a tough spot for Topo Pablo. I mean, he's at ten, and he's facing down ten damage. Like he has to kill something, and then he has to hope that there's there's no damage in Topo Pablo's hand. And so. Is Direwolf Alpha Houndmaster really as strong as this is going to get? Oh my goodness, it looks like it's... I mean, he could play the Hounds and the Houndmaster, clear off uh, the Apprentice, and, but that would only give him a 3-3. Three, three. That would be dead to wrath. This is dangerous. I mean, there are some, there are some draws here for a dude that win the game. Do you hero power and then just try to lethal next turn? I think he's got a hero power. I think quick shotting this 1 1 gives away your win chance. It doesn't give away your win chance, but it certainly cuts into it. I mean, this yeah. does isolate the Arcane Giant, so it cuts Wrath as a potential card for Dude, but then there's that Ancient of War pickup. Now, how on earth is Topo Pablo getting through? Now the Unleash the Hounds is just useless. And this, would have, this is sort of what I was saying before. Um, if he'd left up that Violet Teacher and Dude had gone wide on board again and didn't have a taunt, then that Hounds is much needed damage. But now the Hounds is just useless. That Ancient of War was such a huge pickup. Like that was a game ending Ancient of War. And that's going to do it. There's, there's, the defense here is not available for Topo Pablo. That Ancient of War pickup was huge. Mm -hmm. And Dude is now going to have a 3-1 to one lead. And he got, the war, he got the Druid win out of the way, which was the deck I feared for him. At this point, it is going to be so hard for Topo Pablo to win this series. He dropped the Freeze Mage game early. He couldn't pick up a win with Hunter versus Druid. Yeah, that, that is really, it's just unfortunate for Pablo. He had uh, what should have been a favorable matchup with the Hunter versus the Druid. And unfortunately, even after a series of really nice draws in the early game, uh, you know what, that third swipe from Dude getting it off of the Fandral and the Raven Idol was so necessary. Actually, both the swipe and the Sogoth were really pivotal in this game. Uh, so we actually had a chance to talk to Tobo Pablo about his life outside of Hearthstone. Take a look. First thing I want to talk about, do you remember the times that you've played against me on ladder? Mm. Azumo. Play <laughs> Yeah? See. Sí. You beat me a lot. <laughs> talk to me a little bit about your life outside of Hearthstone. Yeah, actualmente estudio ingeniería comercial. Voy en segundo año en la Católica Valparaíso. Do you uh, incorporate what you learn in engineering into playing Hearthstone? Soy bueno en las matemáticas, incluso Trabajé dos años de croupier del casino black, de Blackjack. Y entonces eh, siempre trato de hacer sumas muy rápidas, tratar de sacar, eh, contar en el turno del oponente y cosas así para no equivocarme. Y sí, creo que ayuda. ¿Qué te gusta hacer besides uh, play Hearthstone? ¿Y qué cosa me gusta o qué me gusta hacer? Me encantan los animales. Tengo muchas mascotas. Tengo cinco gatos, tortugas, o sea, cinco perros, perdón, dos gatos. Eh, bueno, casi diría que todos mis perros son, nosotros los adoptamos de las calles. Los nombres se los pone mi hermana generalmente, algunos no son muy ingeniosos. El gato se llama pez, hay uno que es blanco, se llama blanco. Do you take any inspiration from your pets? Que cuando jugué los preliminares, Eh, le puse los nombres de mis decks, eh, los nombres de mis animales, de mis mascotas, y me fue bien. Entonces ahora volví a repetir lo mismo. Obviamente había que agregar una mascota más porque son cinco decks, así que espero ganar el torneo. Es una cábala. Seven five nine seven going up three games to one over Topo Pablo in the first quarterfinal of the weekend. Pablo has to find a win with three of his decks, and Dude just needs a win with that Dragon Warrior, one of the most consistent decks in tournament play. How can Pablo possibly come back from this, Admirable? Uh, I mean, it's a tremendous uphill battle. I mean, the Hunter is still favored versus the Dragon Warrior matchup, but his Druid and his Shaman are, are going to have a really tough fight ahead of him. You know, when you look at Dude's Dragon Warrior deck in particular, he's cut a lot of the top end out of this game, relying on Curator to kind of effectively be the more top end you need. I mean, he caps out at Curator, Gromish, and Ragnaros. He's not running the Anixia. He doesn't have that Deathwing that's in the build. You know, he doesn't have those big draws that can be as much of a liability. And so as we get into game, Dude's also opened up 
with a pretty reasonable hand here. He's got Alex Ross as champion. He's got a dragon to activate it, and he's got Frothing Berserker. And the Ragnaros, honestly, it, it being in his hand, it's not as bad of a tool versus Hunter as it is, uh, you know, like some of the other late game tools available here. But Topo Pablo going to open up with Fiery Bat, and if that Alex draws his champion manages to live through this uh, this Fiery Bat death rattle, that's a tough call. Yeah, that could uh, spell some serious trouble for Pablo. Uh, I mean, what do you think dude's going to choose to do here? Does he go for the Alex Draza's champion and hope that it ends up living through the death rattle? Um, if it does, that would allow it to kill off the second fiery bat as well, giving dude some really tremendous value. You can just go face here as well. I mean, face is unreasonable, but when you look at, at uh, Topo Pablo's deck list in particular, you know, he's got to worry about quick shots, and then there's also an abusive sergeant and a dire wolf alpha, and a dire wolf alpha, a diary wolf alpha, a dire wolf <laughs> alpha in the build that he'd have to worry about as well. It lives through the death rattle, and so that is two cards for one that dude is getting from this Alex Raza's champion. That is exactly the situation he wants to find himself in. Yeah, I mean, like you said before, the hunter is in a favorable position against the Dragon Warrior, so you, you need to sort of, uh, you know, make up that disadvantage in various ways, and this is one of the ways to do it, getting a two-for-one very early on with the Alex Raza's champion, and now he's able to secure the board for right. himself. It opens the way for that fairy dragon afterwards. Normally, that card's actually pretty poor against Hunter, and... An Argent Horse Rider, I think a very needed draw of Topo Pablo is going to stay in this game. Uh, but this is going to quickly turn into a problem with it. You know, Kill Command's not active, so it doesn't take out Frothing Berserker directly. Uh, he's got no 4-drop and no 5-drop in his hand at the moment. You know, where does he actually get to this Savannah High Maid in a favorable spot uh, looking at this hand? He's going to need to draw definitely into uh, some some valuable 4-drops. Would be really nice for him. Uh, and dude can sort of just play out the curve. He's got the Frothing Berserker on three, Corcoran on four, Drake on five. Um, and you know what? That Ragnaros isn't looking too bad because it means that he does have something to roll into. He's going to be drawing uh, mostly his earlier game cards because he doesn't have a lot of that late game. So by having that late game in hand, uh, his draws are more likely to be playable. And now he secures that late game to play on curve. Yep. And this is where Topo Pablo's really got to worry about the rest of the hand. I mean, he can't identify much of the range from due to this point because there's been nothing that's been played that, that tells you any stories. I mean, I think the only thing he can think right now is that Fiery Wax isn't in Dude's hand. Um, he's going to build a little bit of board tension here and hopefully try to use Unleash the Hounds to try to get some of this back. It is a Grom drawn for Dude, and so his hand is, is lacking utility, but it's just very strong in general. And, and that, I think that's a more important thing for for the warrior to have in this spot. Like, do you, would you rather have utility or would you rather be able to just power out strong minions what? in this particular matchup? You know what, I feel like a lot of the time if you go for utility, you just fall behind against the Hunter. Uh, even, you know, the Fiery War Axe is so strong, and you definitely do want it in the early game, but a lot of the time you just clear off minions, and the Hunter keeps pushing back on board, and then eventually you just don't have any more utility left. You don't have any strong minions on board, and then there's nothing that you can do. So, in this case... It it's so hard to tell, especially because you are, you're trying to make up for lost ground. You're already at a disadvantage. Uh, unfortunately for Pablo, uh, he does get the extra damage onto the Frothing Berserker this time, and he is able to remove it off the board. The problem is the damage has all been cut into, and Houndmaster is about the weakest draw in the deck at the That's moment. That's terrible. I mean, he's staring down a 4-1. He doesn't have a way to take care of it other than use a kill command here. Do you unleash the Hounds? Um, I mean, it's certainly a weak card in this matchup, but... I mean, I, I think he, here's the deal. I think in some capacity, he's got to kill this core chronally. That will start adding up to way too much damage. And when you're slated for Savannah High Man in the following turn, it means that guy's getting in eight points of damage if you don't kill it right now. Yeah. Are either of these cards in your hand worth taking eight points of damage? I can't see that the Unleash the Hounds would be. You're, you're at most going to be going up against, what, three minions on board against the Dragon Warrior? And... In this case, the kill command just represents more damage. I, I agree with that. I, I think Unleash the Hounds in this matchup is pretty poor overall when you consider that, uh, you know, Twilight Guardians uh, exist in this deck, that Curator's part of the top end here, that most of the time they're playing one single big threat at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Pablo's just going to need to play out the Savannah High Main and, and rely on it, essentially. Dude... It uh, doesn't have a super easy way to clear it off. He does have the execute. So picks so, up the second one as well. So dude has entered phase two of the hunter matchup, <laughs> which is can you deal with Savannah High Main? This is like the second part of the raid boss where where he's handled the early game. He's at a is at a fairly decent position, but with the tools he has available right now, can he cleanly check this? If the answer is yes, then phase three is does your opponent have Call of the Wild? That's really like the stages going on here. 
and that's not a mage hero power. A mage hero power would have allowed him to execute this turn, but instead he's got Dagger Mastery, Lesser Heal, and Steady Shot. So is Dude the Aggressor just yet? I don't think so. Lesser Heal's not providing him value, and unless he wants to sacrifice his Azure Drake to a activate Execute, he, you know, that just spells out the Lesser Heal oh, here. Wow. So it's going to be a more slow approach here. Mm -hmm. the second Azure Drake. So he's building Vortension tension and he's trying to become the aggressor at this point. Is this enough to direct the attacks away? And when Eagle Horn Bow gets drawn, I don't think it is. I think we're going to start seeing the push here from Topo Pablo. Absolutely. I love that Pablo, again, like you said um, before, he's, he's very good at identifying what his win condition is and going for it. He doesn't play around cards that he knows it's not worth it to play around. In this case, he had to rely on Savannah Hymane, and he's making it work. He put Dude down to 11 health. Is this enough, though? I mean, Dude has a, a pretty fantastic reload to this. You know, he's got... Finley running into Savannah Jaime with Execute to back it up. He's got multiple options to handle the rest of the board state. Can he push enough damage or stabilize before Topo Pablo makes that final push? Well, dude can, uh, I imagine in this case, you want to play the Corcoran, clear out the Houndmaster. You can't take any more damage to face. Um, and then you have to trade your Drakes into the Hyenas and, and simply heal your face back up to 13. You're playing very defensively, and that's a lot of the time not what the Dragon Warrior wants to do. Yeah, I'm curious, looking at, at last turn, if Topo Pablo is supposed to actually attack the Finley there instead of attacking the face. I mean, dude would be at 14, but that execute would have been much harder for dude to activate. I think when he plays the Finley, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit obvious that he's fishing for a way to handle mm -hmm. the the Savannah Hymen with an activator and execute. I think that Topo Pablo could have potentially read into that, attacked that Finley, and made it more awkward for dude to answer. Instead, he's in this position, and I think it's going to be really tough for him to to close this easily. I mean, he's got five, six, seven, eight. He's got ten damage showing right now. Is this enough? That's, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Topo Pablo going to pick up a win with Hunter. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it potentially could have. Oh wait a minute! Wait a minute! He cannot activate quick shot and uh, steady shot this turn. Mm -hmm. So it's huge toad. Kill command. Kill command face. Attack face. Hero power. Hero power. And then hope that's enough. And it, it, there's not really another source of healing in dude's deck, no. so I think this should basically this close should it. close it out. Yeah, a little a little bit uh, preemptive from us, just because he does not actually have nine mana on this turn, but. Uh, essentially, this is the yeah. damage that he needed to close out the game, and dude just doesn't have any other way to heal other than uh, the lesser heal. So right. the three from Quick Shot and two from the Hero Power is going to be enough to close it out, and Pablo is going to uh, take his second win in this match. Yeah, I believe the maximum amount of damage that he could deal this turn was actually with the Ragnaros. He doesn't have Inner Rage in the build, so yeah. he couldn't activate Grom. Um, and so even if Ragnaros w went face in this situation, the damage wouldn't be there to close. And obviously, dude's going to play it out. He's going to, you know, give his best options. Doesn't actually have a dragon in hand, uh, so that Corruptor wouldn't be a great option anyway, but yeah, he has to know. He, he's dead to three, and he needs to heal, so you can't actually play the Rag and the Grom safely. Yeah, so the question here is how you win. Uh, that's just what Dude's got to look at. Like, how does he deal the most damage here over a couple turns, and can he live through any extra source of damage from Topo Pablo's deck? I think a lot of what Dude's thinking about right now is is where the huge toad actually lands. Like, if it lands on his face, he's dead to just hero power yeah. if, if he plays something like Grom. Um, you know, he's dead to quick shot, he's dead to kill command, he's going to be dead to unleash the hounds. I feel like his best chance to win is actually Grom, attack the huge toad, push face for eight, and then hope that there's not the damage there to deliver. That's what he's going to conclude. He sees it. Yeah, but, I mean, it's a great spot for dude here. The damage even goes to face, yeah. so. <laughs> All right, so Pablo not even needing that quick shot, but he does have uh, the extra reach that he would have needed, and there's even the, more damage. The embarrassment of riches at this point for Topo Pablo. Three to two now, still in favor of Dude, but I'll tell you what, the stress is real for Dude at, th at this point. I mean, we've seen him look uncomfortable almost the entire mm -hmm. match, and Topo Pablo, he's gotten a little bit more serious towards the tail end, but when he lost that double Yogg's round game, he was all smiles. He was having fun, and you know, you, you never want to be on the losing end of a game, but when something quite as ridiculous as, as you know 22 yog spells and and you still lose you know that that's something you just have to have fun with because that is so very rare uh so let's before we get into game number six take a quick look at topo pablo's playstyle. what's your playstyle like in hearthstone mi estilo como jugador es agresivo claro como tú dices juego muy arriesgado Más que nada porque me aburre, digamos, el, los otros decks 
y me acomoda mucho jugar eh, de ex agro. Taking a win with his hunter over Dude's Dragon Warrior deck, putting him still at a one-game deficit. It is three to two in favor of Dude, but he is attempting to make a climb back into this match. Dude just has to get a single win with that Dragon Warrior to put himself through to the semifinals and to day two of the America's Summer Championships. Admirable, this warrior deck is so consistent. How can Pablo possibly take advantage and try to swing the games into his favor? Well, we saw the Dragon Warrior versus, uh, we saw the the, uh, the Dragon Warrior versus uh, Hunter matchup take place. And I mentioned kind of phase two with the Savannah High main. Can dude get past that? Topo Pablo has gotten past phases one of the Dragon Warrior, which is picking up a win with the Hunter. Now he's on to phase two, and phase two is incredibly <laughs> difficult, which is Druid, beating Dragon Warrior. Now, the token Druid, I do think, has a little bit better matchup than sort of the Malagos versions do. Uh, Execute is really paramount in this matchup for Dude to handle threats at, that are at the right time. And Topo Pablo has the kind of hand that can get off to a blistering start here. He's got Innervate, he's got Violet Teacher, he's got Meyer Keeper. He has to navigate this very well to find the, uh, the board state that can check Dude's early game and then launch an assault afterwards. For all intents and purposes, Topo Pablo has to be the aggressor in this matchup, even though he also kind of has to be the control deck. He has to find that small window of opportunity mm -hmm. to turn the corner. And you know what? Pablo's been really good at doing that so far. He's been able to correctly identify where his win condition and what, where his win condition is when he needs to sort of play that aggressor or play that more control style. So if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's definitely Pablo. But dude's hand is looking very, very strong right now. I'm curious if he's going for the for the Meyer Keeper or the Violet Teacher, if he's going to innovate. You know, it, getting the Violet Teacher on, not online right now means that two hits of Fiery War Axe is going to kill it. Yeah. It means that you, you have, you've checked Alex Dodge's champion or Fairy Dragon preemptively. Meyer Keeper is going to accelerate your mana curve a little bit to try to unlock some more options here. All right, and Pablo is going to ramp up. He's going to have three mana available to him next turn. Uh, but this Meyer Keeper is easily checked by the Fiery War Axe. And dude does pick up a dragon, meaning that Alex Dodge's champion is now live. Yeah, this is looking like a great hand for Dude. And Mulch gets picked up. It's a key card, but it's a bit too early right yeah. now. That card is more reserved for, like, the uh, like Gromish scream, Ragnaros. You know, if a Draken Crusher gets active, those sorts of situations. And Tobo Pablo here, he recognizes that even though Ravaging Ghoul is a strong play against him, he, he likely just can't wait that long. He's just going to try to get something on board and uh, have anything to contest. All right, so Dude staring down those two little saplings. Uh, not too threatening, but uh, certainly something you, you don't want to leave active just because of the potential to uh, you know com combine with something like Wrath uh, and get the Fierce Monkey off board. So Dude is just going to play down that Fierce Monkey, and uh, what would you do, Admiral Bull? Would you swing into one of these saplings? Absolutely not at this stage. I mean, if Dude finds himself in a position where Topo Pablo is having to answer all of his minions, what that means is every single turn, Dude just plays another minion. That's what this deck is designed to do, is just play strong minions on curve. If Topo Pablo is exhausting resources taking care of your stuff, that is right into where Dude's wheelhouse is right now. This Fierce Monkey is challenging every range of option that Topo Pablo can have right now because of that Fiery War Axe. And the Fierce Monkey is something that's sort of been a recent addition into the Dragon Warrior um, after Karazhan because of the Curator, which is also sort of finding its way into the Dragon Warrior decks. Really interesting. It, it draws you uh, one beast, one dragon, and one murloc. So with the addition of the Fierce Monkey in the deck, it is a beast. Um, and that means you can, in the late game, refuel your hand with something like Finley, uh, the Fierce Monkey, and then, you know, any of the, the plenty of dragons you do have in the deck. Right. So that's sort of given the, drag, the Dragon Warrior um, some more staying power in the meta and a bit of a new identity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a staple. It definitely is. I mean, I, I, can you imagine not playing that card in Dragon Warrior? It just seems too good. It's way too good. It just seems too it's good. It's got taunt for some reason. <laughs> and it, it's something, the Curator, I feel like, is something that people just sort of laughed off initially. They're like, oh, it, you know, it, a dragon, a murloc, and a beast. When are those ever going to be in the same deck? Well, people are finding ways to do it, and it's it's really, really good. Um, it's been compared to Ancient of Lore, actually, as, as just strictly better if you are able to draw uh, all three cards, and it's got taunt. Wow, dude's hand is so good right now. I mean, obviously, the Violet Teacher is slated for a kill here. Question is, what do you, what do, you do it with? 
And I'm thinking that the Frothing Berserker is looking massive at this point. It looks like he's going to deviate a bit, though. So this, this tells me he wants to get an, another minion online, which is really interesting to me. So Alex shows a champion fire war X is going to answer this. He wants that taunt to stay in place. Ah, he's protecting the fairy dragon. So that makes sense uh, to do mm -hmm. it this way. I'm, I'm guessing that there is a chance he attacks this 1-1 this one, one token to avoid wrath and hero power being an effect. Yeah, Wild I growth. Think. Not the draw right now. All right, so Pablo needs something off of Raven Idol. What is good here? None of Not those. Not those cards. Wow, that is bad. That's that's very unfortunate. Uh, something like a Wrath would have been very nice. Um, he needed he need, honestly needed something like I don't even know if swipe spell, would have been good. I'm curious if spell is even good here because what I'm looking at with this is I'm trying to actually think of a spell you would want to get mm -hmm. in this position. I think a four drop minion might have just been better. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Like this is, a, well, I think, one of the rare situations where you can go for a minion. And if you take into account the fact that you're going to discover druid cards more often than you discover yes. neutral cards, it means that Fandral's a potential to grab. It means that you could grab Mounted Raptor sometimes here. It means that you could get a Keeper of the Grove, which while Keeper of the Grove isn't like super strong on this board, could potentially kill it both challenges minions. the board. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I feel like, especially with Raven Idol, just because, you know, 99% of the time the spell is going to be more valuable, but a lot of the time people just auto-pick that spell. But there are these rare occasions when potentially uh, the minion could just put you ahead. Yeah, and sometimes typically in these spots, Azure Drake is kind of like the weaker 5-drop that this deck has. When you're ahead, though, Azure Drake is massive onto this board state. I mean, Topo Pablo has no answers for what's going on, just relegated to Arcane Giant. It's still a strong play, but it doesn't feel very good. And dude had an oh execute right my now. My God, that's good enough. That Blackwing Corruptor is a massive draw for dude right now. <laughs> oh my goodness, Pablo just not finding any help. Doesn't have to do whatsoever. Yeah, just both Frothing Berserkers. Like it's it's clear that Topo Pablo cannot answer your board state. That's the time to push. When your opponent has that weak turn of development, that's when you go for the throw. Oh man, how does Pablo come back from this? Dude is looking to close out this game on the next turn, and Pablo needs to nourish for some draw, and he's got to find a miracle at this point. Well, oh. Mm, can he survive? So Wrath, oh, he could definitely survive he's, this he's turn. He's got the Mark of the Wild. I, I don't know, if he uses Innervate to cast Mark of the Wild here, it means that Yogg-Saron is going to be delayed by a turn. And Yogg-Saron, I think right now, is clearly where Topo Pablo's win condition is. So my question is, how does he actually sequence this where he gets out of this situation okay? And it might be something like Innervate Mulch, actually, because the Frothing Berserkers have just turned into such a massive threat at this point. One Frothing Berserker is going to be five power. You're going to have a five health mm -hmm. Arcane Giant, and you're only at 16 right now. If he Innervates Mulch, yeah. delays the Yogg-Saron. If he doesn't mulch, is he taking too much damage? I mean, if he attacks the Frothing Zerker here and runs into Ravaging Ghoul, that's basically it. So can Pablo live for two more turns uh, if he chooses to Innervate, mulch, remove both of the Frothing Berserkers? Oh man, it's, 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 I think this is the only way that you can potentially win. He's got to live for one more turn though. Yep, so there's the mulch. And I mean, it is awfully close. If he lives for another turn, I'd be a little bit like if he, could get to, if he can get to 10 mana, I'd yeah. be a little bit surprised. Dude's hand is just so strong at the moment. Blackwing Corruptor with a dragon in hand. Fiery War Axe available. If Dude even wants to remove that Arcane Giant, he can just Blood to Icker and then Blackwing Corruptor and then remove it because of the spell damage from the yeah. Azure Drake. And then he gets the 5-4 minion plus the 2-2 slime token. That, that should be enough, I believe. He pushes 7, so Tubble Paul is going down to 9. Pablo does have the Mark of the Wild. He can make a taunt minion. Um, but what can I mean, he draw? What taunt minion is the sustains question. this? Nine. So he's got a pull. He's got oh, wow. Okay, so he can swipe honestly, Power of the Wild and Mark of the Wild. That's a that's a good draw here too. Yeah, because he gets the extra spells loaded on this as well. I mean that's something else he really needed here too, is the Yogi needs to be just be just bigger. Mm -hmm. He's gotta go for it. Alright, so 5-4 taunt. <laughs> I think dude can can sniff this out here too. It's like he knows that Yogg-Saron's coming. Draws in his deck to kill him. Uh, Ragnaros is going to kill him. Corcoran Elite's going to kill him. Alex Strauss is champion. Blackwing Corruptor, is that enough? Blackwing Corruptor. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That is enough. 
That is going to be more than enough. And dude, 7597 looking noticeably relieved as he takes a win in the first match of the day over Topo Pablo. Yep, and he, he looks so much more composed in this game number seven. Or I'm sorry, in this game number six as well. I mean, that's something really big to note is all of his competitive experience in the past, I think really shining through in this sixth and final game. You know, a very strong hand obviously will get you a little bit more relaxed, but just having the experience of competing and, and being able to think through everything despite the stress of the situation, just fantastic win for dude absolutely and you know in some of dude's interviews we saw that he does have a pretty a pretty steely mindset he plays ultimate frisbee he's used to competition uh certainly a fantastic ladder player so i i'm i'm willing to bet that 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 confidence and that cool composure really helped him out today but we're gonna throw it over to fireside where tj has an interview with our winner that's right, guys. I'm joined here by Dude, the winner of the first match of the day. Uh, first of all, Dude, you looked really nervous going into that. Uh, talk to me about your mindset going into the match and how you feel now that you've you've won. Uh, well, I was really nervous um, when I was playing Hearthstone with with Admirable yesterday. Uh, he was telling me like he was really impressed by Top of Pablo and how he thinks about the game. So I knew he was a formidable oppo formidable opponent. And and now that you've won, how do you feel? Uh, I feel really relieved. <laughs> well, uh, I did pick you as my prediction to win the whole thing, so uh, are you going to take it all the way? I'll do my best. <laughs> all right, thanks, man. That's all I can hope for. Well, congratulations. I'll let you go. Sort of prepare for your next match and rest up. So uh, we are going to jump into the next match of the day, the second quarterfinal. It's going to be 